spent any time on the internet, I'm sure you've encountered at least a few viral hoaxes over the past few years. In this video, I'll be discussing three online hoaxes that you may or may not have heard about. The first case I'll be sharing with you today is pretty well known. Let's get into the story of Casey Nicole Swenson. Casey Nicole was a teenage girl living in Kansas, Oklahoma. In many ways, she was a typical teenager who loved music, movies, and sports. She had a profile under the name Cute Babe on the College Club website where she spent countless hours posting articles and hosting chats. She made many friends to this site, including both other users as well as employees who she would send gifts to. In 2000, she told one of her online friends, a man named Randall Vanderwoning, that she had leukemia which was in remission. After a brief period of time, she revealed that her leukemia was recurrent and she was ill again. Randall was moved by her story and he offered to help her set up a blog which she would host and cover all costs for. She agreed to his offer and began to post updates to her new blog called Living Colors. She would update her blog with posts where she discussed her treatment and hospitalizations. She did her best to remain positive even when she was feeling extremely weak, such as talking about her favorite doctor who she found cute. Many readers found her attitude inspiring. Her mother, Debbie Swenson, also ran an accompanying blog where she discussed how she helped her daughter through her medical issues. Casey's blog ended up garnering millions of readers who were touched by her story. She frequently received letters, cards, and gifts through the mail as she'd set up a post box so her fans could contact her. Casey would also chat online and over the phone with people who were following her posts. In April of 2001, Casey updated her blog with the news that her liver was failing. Randall was extremely upset by this, and he begged to be able to visit his friend Casey because he couldn't stand to lose a friend without ever meeting her. Casey agreed to let him visit after she got back from another trip to see the ocean. But before he could meet her, he received a phone call from her mother who was crying uncontrollably. Through her tears, she told Randall that Casey had died suddenly. On May 15th, a final entry was posted to Casey's blog by the web host, Randall. It said that she'd passed away two days earlier due to a brain aneurysm. The final post read, Thank you for the love, the joy, the laughter, and the tears. We shall love you always and forever. Casey Nicole passed away May 14th, 2001, at the age of 19. Her mother, Debbie, later said that Casey had been cremated and a memorial service was held two days after her passing. Many people who'd followed along with Casey's battle with leukemia and were moved by her untimely death posted their condolences and tributes to her after this final entry. Others wanted to send cards and flowers to her post office box, but they were told that it no longer existed. On May 17th, a blog entry was posted by a woman named Sandra Mitchell where she wrote a satirical post about people who faked illnesses online. She didn't specify who she was talking about until a day later, where she made another blog post discussing the inaccuracies in Casey's story and calling her out as a fraud. The blog has since been taken down, but I found this comment that was quoting some of her posts, where she points out that it was very unlikely that within just two days of Casey's death, Debbie would have been able to have Casey's body embalmed and cremated, and then plan and hold a memorial service, especially when it was known that she had relatives who didn't live in Oklahoma. Sandra also looked into the IP address of Casey's blog posts and determined that she was posting from Peabody, Kansas. She made calls to people living there, asking if anyone had information about Casey, but no one knew what she was talking about. Based on this blog post, a discussion was posted on Metafilter on May 18th, a few days after the announcement of Casey's death. The original post reads, Is it possible that Casey did not exist? This is a really delicate thing here. Please be really thoughtful about this. I promise I'm not trying to stir the shit without cause. There are some people who are wondering whether Casey was a real 19-year-old leukemia patient and whether things actually occurred the way they've been reported online. More inside, friends. Users on the thread began picking apart the story, including inaccuracies in how her leukemia treatment was portrayed and inconsistencies in the timeline of her death. Initially, the suggestion that Casey was fake was met with quite a bit of resistance from people who said they'd spoken to her and knew that she was real. However, as more threads were created and more inconsistencies were discussed, like Casey not having an obituary, it became clear that something was definitely amiss in Casey's story. On May 19th, Debbie called Randall and confessed to him that Casey wasn't her real daughter, she was actually a foster daughter. Randall agreed to keep this a secret. However, on May 20th, Randall made a blog post about a confession that had been emailed to him. It stated that Casey was entirely fictional and someone had been playing the role of her the entire time. And this confession came from none other than Debbie Swenson, the woman pretending to be Casey's mother. In one final blog post, Debbie wrote that her name was not Casey and she was not my daughter. 
She said that the online diary was about the lives of three people who suffered with cancer. I am to blame for wanting to tell their stories. I am to blame for weaving the lives of all three together. As it turns out, Debbie wasn't actually the one who initially created Casey. The website and images were first posted by her teenage daughter Kelly and her friends, but they didn't really establish a character for Casey or write any stories. When Debbie found out about the site, instead of asking her daughter to take it down, she just decided to take over the site and start posting as Casey. This is when she invented the leukemia storyline. The photos of Casey on the site were actually of a college student in Debbie's town named Julie Fulbright, and they were posted without her knowledge. After the hoax came to light, Debbie called Julie to apologize. According to Julie's mother, Debbie said, I don't know why I did it, and kept asking for forgiveness from Julie and her mother. Debbie never revealed who spoke on the phone as Casey, but Randall believes that she did it herself. He said, anyone who can convince me of severe emotional distress can certainly change the pitch of her voice to sound younger. People who'd been in contact with Casey were understandably extremely upset when it was revealed to be a hoax. They'd not only been catfished by someone, but they'd also been tricked into thinking that someone they cared for had battled cancer for years before dying. Here's one blog post from John, who was a close friend of Casey's. He wrote, It appears that Casey was not real. I don't know what to say. I'm relieved. I'm crushed. I'm confused. I feel like it's the end of the sixth sense or the usual suspects and I'm going through every scene, trying to revisualize what really happened. Who did I talk to on the phone? Who sent the Halloween candy? Who emailed me for consolation when her beloved Dr. John died in an auto accident last year? Who sent me the Kansas City Royals hat? KC, get it? And signed it with KC's name. Who did I speak to on the phone and who left me so many voice messages when I was at college club? Who opened the care package of cool hats I sent to cover Casey's balding head? In terms of a punishment for the scam, the information on the case was turned over to the FBI shortly after it was revealed to be a hoax. However, an FBI agent named Jeff Lanza gave a statement that they would not be investigating the case because the total damages in terms of gifts and donations received were estimated to only have added up to a couple hundred dollars. The FBI usually only gets involved when the losses are far higher than that. So Debbie never received any legal repercussions, but she definitely received a ton of online backlash. And that's the end of Casey's story. I wish I could have shown you more screenshots like the College Club profile or Casey's blog, but a ton of information from this story has been lost to time. If you find this case interesting and would like to read about similar stories, I would encourage you to look up other cases of Munchausen by internet like Belle Gibson. It's quite a rabbit hole and something that I personally find fascinating. The second hoax I'll be discussing today is based around this YouTube video, posted in 2010 by the channel DJ Def Joey. It's called My Dead Great Grandma's Coffin in My Own Backyard. As of right now, it has almost 4 million views. In the video, you can see a man showing off the coffin and body of his dead great grandmother, who he said passed away in 1945. He explains that about 20 years before making this video, her area in the cemetery was closed, so he was given her coffin to keep in his backyard. He shows some close-up shots of the body, then leans in to kiss her. He concludes the video by saying that he doesn't have anywhere else to put her body. The video finishes off by crediting DJ Def Joey as himself and his grandmother as herself. Interestingly, he mentions that she died on Halloween. Based on the comments, a lot of people who've seen this video believe that it's real. However, looking a bit deeper into DJ Def Joey himself, it seems like this video is likely just a well-executed hoax. Let's take a look at his Facebook page. In 2016, he posted a picture to his Facebook page where you can see one hand that looks very injured. In the comments, a lot of people are asking if it's fake. Joey skirts around giving a straight answer to this. However, he does leave one comment that reads, Check my introduction to my page, you will know. Just got home from the hospital. In the replies, he again stresses that someone should take a look at his description of himself. Clicking on his about page, we can see that he describes himself as a special effects makeup artist. It's obvious that he was trying to coax the countless commenters asking if it was fake into realizing that it was done via makeup and prosthetics. I also found his Pinterest account where there are a lot of posts about making special effects as well as posts about horror in general. It's clear that Joey just loves creepy stuff. You can also see this interest in some of the other videos on his YouTube channel where he talks about horror movies and has horror decor in his house. Of course, just being interested in horror doesn't prove anything, and you could maybe even use this to argue that only someone who loves horror would do this with a corpse but I really don't think this is the case. So let's go back to his Facebook page. Joey posted a few photos of the coffin here. In this post, you'll notice that he only likes comments that express doubt about the legitimacy of the body and doesn't acknowledge the ones that believe it's real. Here's another similar post. As usual, he avoids giving a direct answer when people ask if it's real. 
He usually replies with comments that sound kind of sarcastic. Here, someone commented that Joey had changed his story on how he was related to the corpse, with her going from a great-grand-aunt to great-grandmother. He just replies, Isn't it obvious that it changed the story? Ha. And is clearly not denying that he made up the story. He also likes a lot of comments that explain that it's for his Halloween party, or say that he makes similar things for Halloween. One person even says outright that it's fake and he did it for Halloween a few years ago, to which he replies, Are you sure it's fake? Scratching my head. I'm just smiling. So while I know there's no concrete proof that this video is a hoax because Joey never gives a straight answer, I think it's pretty safe to say that it isn't real. My best guess would be that Joey wanted to make something really scary and realistic for a Halloween party, and then he decided to show it off in a YouTube video. However, I think that Joey did an amazing job on the special effects because it truly does look like a real corpse. There's definitely a reason why so many people believe that he really does keep a dead body in his yard. The last hoax I'll be sharing with you today is Alexandria's Genesis. One of the earliest known posts of someone claiming that Alexandria's Genesis is real is from 2005, where a poster on the forum above Top Secret claims that they know someone who has purple eyes. They did their own research and found a website that discusses a condition called Alexandria's Genesis. Here's a quick rundown of the characteristics of Alexandria's Genesis from the link in this post. The most defining characteristic of Alexandria's Genesis is of course the purple eyes. When a child is born with this condition, they have clear silvery purple eyes which darken to a more vibrant shade of purple until they experience puberty. They have no issues with vision and they in fact have perfect eyesight. They don't grow any body hair other than what they're born with. The hair on their head is dark brown or black. They're unable to become overweight because their metabolism prevents them from gaining too much fat. Their bodies are described as well-developed and perfectly proportioned. Their skin tone is shimmering and white. Their skin does not tan or burn in the sun. If the mutation is passed down to a child that's biracial, they'll get all the characteristics of Alexandria's genesis from the parent who gave it to them. They'll still have light skin, but not as light as their parent who has the mutation. These biracial children are described as looking very Euro-American. Apart from their appearance, people with Alexandria's genesis have very different bodily functions. They don't menstruate or produce any waste. They generally look 5 to 20 years younger than they are. Once they turn 21 years old, they age extremely slowly and they eventually stop aging once they reach around 40 to 50 years of age. However, they live anywhere between 130 and 170 years. This is likely because they have a highly evolved immune system that resists every known disease or illness. Also contained in this link is information on the origins of Alexandria's Genesis, which I'll read verbatim. Alexandria's Genesis, as it has been called since the 1960s, is a genetic mutation generally found in women of Euro-American, aka Caucasian, descent. This mutation can be traced as far as the Middle Ages in Northern Europe. The first known record of Alexandria's Genesis was written in the year CE 1330, Common Era. A woman named Alexandria Augustine came into the world on April 29th, CE 1329 in London, England. At the time, she appeared to be normal, but her parents soon noticed that her eyes were changing from the blue eyes Alexandria had at birth to the purple eyes she would have by her first birthday. The parents were startled by this dramatic change. They took her to their priest, thinking that a witch did this to their child, and that the priest might be able to ask God to change the eye color back. The priest told the parents that it was not the work of the devil, but a myth come true. This particular priest had heard a story about a race of people who had purple eyes. These humans were thought to have come from Egypt after a mysterious light flashed in the sky during a moonless night thousands of years ago. The purple-eyed humans also had very fair skin and were thought to be spirits because of their appearance. The so-called spirit people eventually went north and vanished without a trace. The priest told her parents not to worry for they had a special child in their hands and they should take good care of her. Eventually, Alexandria grew up to be a very beautiful woman, got married, had four children, all four were girls, and all four also had the mutation, never got sick, and died at the age of 150 of natural causes. It is this discovery that helped to name the genetic mutation when the gene was discovered in 1968. The person concludes their forum post by saying, So could this mutation come from somewhere else besides Earth? I talked to her brother about this and he found more info on it. He said that the 15th generation to have this has much, much stronger symptoms, i.e. stronger, lives longer, I am still a little skeptical about her having this, but too many things fall into place. While a few replies on this forum post are from people who believe that Alexandria's genesis could be real, there are a lot more people who point out that it's obviously fake. But these naysayers didn't stop the information about Alexandria's genesis from being spread around the internet in the early 2010s. 
This was usually in the form of a photo of a vibrant purple eye with a description of the symptoms of the condition. It's notable that most of the posts being shared around tend to focus on the eye color and lack of body hair and menstruation instead of the extremely unbelievable aspects, like living for almost 200 years. And as you might have already guessed, there's certainly no record of anyone in London having Alexandria's genesis in 1329. The real origin of Alexandria's genesis is actually a Daria fanfiction written in 1998 by someone named Cameron Aubernon. The link shared in the 2005 forum post is actually an archive from one of her fanfictions. In 2014, Cameron actually wrote a Tumblr post explaining why she made up Alexandria's genesis and how shocked she was to see it being portrayed as a real condition. She said, On the night of 15th December 2011, something I created under a male pseudonym when I was 19 turned up on my Tumblr dashboard. Something that I made up as a silly backstory for my two Daria-based Mary Sues, fanfiction characters who are perfect in every manner possible, and then some. Something that, in turn, was a projection of my personal gender identity and body image issues that I was starting to confront in my 20s. This something, in the 15 years since I first wrote it, had taken a life of its own. This something was Alexandria's Genesis, a fictional post-human slash alien genetic mutation I created in order to make my Mary Sues, one female, one male, more special. Alas, AG had also evolved into Children of the Violet Ray Fodder, all to the point that some individuals legitimately believed that it was not only real, but that they actually had the condition. In this post, Cameron goes to further break down why she made the condition, why she chose some of the characteristics, and why it's completely unbelievable. She finishes off her post by saying, AG was overall a silly plot device that also comes off as unintentionally misogynistic and racist, but somehow escaped the confines of a now-deceased Daria fanfiction site into the wild open plains of the internet. I can't explain how this happened, or who first thought this was a real thing, but the elephant in the room has a question. Why is the only known document regarding a post-human slash alien genetic mutation posted on a fanfiction website? If I wanted to post this as a real document for new agers to swallow hook, line, sinker, I would have just created some lame GeoCities website and been done with it. I included the Alexandria's Genesis hoax in my video because I actually fell for it as a kid. Only the part about having purple eyes and no body hair, though. I thought it was a similar condition to being albino. And just as a little bonus, I wanted to share a hoax that I believed when I was even younger and more gullible. If you're Canadian, you'll probably recognize this one. It's nighttime in a kitchen just like yours. All is quiet. Or is it? The North American House Hippo is found throughout Canada and the Eastern United States. House hippos are very timid creatures and are rarely seen, but they will defend their territory if provoked. They come out at night to search for food, water, and materials for their nests. The favorite foods of the house hippo are chips, raisins, and the crumbs from peanut butter on toast. They build their nests in bedroom closets, using lost mittens, dryer lint, and bits of string. The nests have to be very soft and warm. House hippos sleep about 16 hours a day. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'd love it if you left a comment sharing the online hoax that you find the most ridiculous or interesting. I'd also like to say thank you to Beth for helping me add timestamps to some of my longer videos. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you again in the next video.